This is our last video talking about the basics of spinners in 3D space and 4D space time from a mathematical point of view. And we're going to talk about a deep concept we've been approaching for a while, called the double cover, which leads to the notion of a spin group. This will set the stage for the next set of videos in the series where we discuss Clifford algebras, also called geometric algebras. Over the last few videos, we showed how 3D vectors are rotated with the special orthogonal 3x3 matrices, SO3. We also showed that there was an alternative way of doing rotations, where the vector was written as a 2x2 matrix called a Pauli vector, and is rotated with a double-sided transformation using special unitary 2x2 matrices, SU2. As I mentioned in video 6.1, the SU2 matrices are completely equivalent to unit quaternions, so I'll be talking about them in this video as well. We say that the SU2 matrices are the double cover of SO3 matrices, because for every 3x3 rotation matrix R, there are a pair of SU2 matrices, plus U and minus U, that perform the same rotation. Because the transformation is double-sided, if we replace plus u with minus u, the two minus signs will cancel out, leading to the same transformation we started with. This is an algebraic view of what it means for SU2 to be the double cover of SO3. However, there is also a topological interpretation for this concept of a double cover. Topology is an area of math that's sometimes called rubber sheet geometry, because it involves studying the overall shape and connectedness of various spaces without worrying about exact sizes and angles. When we study the topology of SO3, or SU2, we're studying the shape of what these spaces of rotations look like, and how the space is connected with itself. It turns out that the space of SU2 matrices looks like a three-dimensional sphere that lives in four-dimensional space, called the three-sphere, or S3 for short. This is a simplified view that looks more like a two-dimensional sphere, because a true three-dimensional sphere is too difficult to draw. A true three-sphere has points that are specified by three angles instead of two angles. The space of SO3 matrices looks like a real projective 3 space, RP3, which sort of looks like half of a 3 sphere where if we walk off one edge, we get teleported to the other side. Let's try and understand what these spaces look like. It can be pretty difficult to get an intuition for what we mean when we say SU2 is the 3 sphere and SO3 is real projective 3 space and to understand why one is the double cover of the other. These spaces are too high-dimensional to easily visualize, so let's start simple by working with the one sphere, which is the circle, and real projective line, and work our way up from there. We've already discussed the real projective line in video 5 in this series. If we start with the 2D plane, and draw a vertical screen at x equals 1, we can project points onto the screen by drawing lines that connect points to the origin, and seeing where these lines intersect the screen. The resulting space on the screen is called the real projective line, RP1. If we draw a circle centered at the origin, and try projecting various points on the circle onto the screen, we find that opposite points on the circle exist on the same line through the origin, and so they will get projected to the same point on the screen. This means that, for every one point in the real projective line, there are two points on the circle. For this reason, we say that the circle, S1, is the double cover of the real projective line, RP1. If I do a single loop around the real projective line, we only cover half of the circle. It takes two full loops around the real projective line to cover the full circle. So the real projective line is a bit like a half circle, where walking off one edge immediately teleports you to the other side. A given point on the real projective line can be described by a ratio of x-y coordinates. 
Any points with the same y over x ratio will be connected by the same line through the origin, and so are projected to the same point on the real projective line. This pattern extends in higher dimensions. If we start in 3D space and place a 2D screen at x equals 1, and then project points onto the screen along lines through the origin, the screen ends up being the real projective plane, RP2. If we take a sphere centered at the origin and project its points onto the plane, we find that opposite points on the sphere exist on the same line through the origin, and so they get projected to the same point on the real projective plane. So for every point on the real projective plane, there are a pair of points on the two sphere that get projected to it. And so we say that the two sphere is the double cover of RP2. The real projective plane can be thought of like a half sphere, where walking off the edge immediately teleports you to the opposite edge. Points in the real projective plane can be described by a pair of ratios, y over x and z over x. Any points in three-dimensional space with these same ratios will exist along the same line through the origin, and so they will get projected to the same point on the real projective plane. This pattern continues in the next dimension, with the three-sphere, which is too high-dimensional for us to visualize, but we can describe it with an equation. The real projective three-space, RP3, is also too high-dimensional for us to visualize. However, we can think of it as the three-sphere with opposite points projected to the same point in three-dimensional space. Points in real projective 3 space can be described by three ratios, y over x, z over x, and w over x. Any points in four-dimensional space that have the same three ratios will exist along the same line through the origin, and so they will get projected to the same point in real projective 3 space. RP3 can be thought of as half of a three-sphere where if we walk off the edge, we get immediately teleported to the other side. So what does this have to do with SU2 matrices being the double cover of SO3 matrices? Well, it turns out that SU2 is shaped like the 3 sphere, and SO3 is shaped like the real projective 3 space. We'll show this starting with SU2. Let's take a 2x2 two two matrix with complex entries alpha, beta, gamma, delta. If this matrix is unitary, it means the matrix's Hermitian conjugate is equal to its inverse. Taking the Hermitian conjugate is easy. It's just the complex conjugate transpose. And the formula for the inverse of a 2x2 two two matrix is well known. If the matrix is special, this means the determinant equals plus 1. And so we can take the determinant part of the formula and set it to plus 1. So for special unitary 2x2 two two matrices, we end up with gamma equals negative beta complex conjugate and delta equals alpha complex conjugate. So this is the form of an SU2 matrix, defined by two complex numbers, alpha and beta. But remember, the determinant equals plus 1, so alpha alpha star plus beta beta star must equal 1. If we replace alpha with the complex number a plus bi, and replace beta with the complex number c plus di, and distribute, we end up with the formula a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared equals 1. If we think of a, b, c, and d as coordinate variables in four-dimensional space, this is the equation for a three-dimensional sphere. There are three free parameters. Once we specify a, b, and c, then d is automatically determined by the equation. So the three-sphere is a three-dimensional space, parameterized by three coordinates. This makes sense since SU2 is the space of three possible rotations, in the xy plane, the yz plane, and the zx plane. Now recall, I said that when it comes to double-sided transformations, the SU2 matrices plus U and minus U will do the same rotation, because the negative signs will always cancel out in a double-sided transformation. 
So if we think of our three sphere, the matrices plus U and minus U would be on opposite sides, and they perform the exact same rotation. If we can imagine projecting plus U and minus U along the same line through the origin onto a screen, the result would be a point in real projective three space, RP3, which is when we have a three-dimensional screen living in four-dimensional space. This point corresponds to the SO3 rotation matrix R, which does the same rotation as both plus U and minus U. Remember, there are two SU2 matrices for every SO3 matrix that performs the same rotation. Both plus U and minus U perform the same rotation as R. The SO3 group is what we get when we simply forget about the differences between plus U and minus U and treat them as the same rotation R. This is why SO3 has the shape of real projective 3 space. This brings up a key difference between the topologies of SU2 and SO3. SU2 has the property of being a simply connected space, whereas SO3 is not a simply connected space. I'll explain what this means. Loosely speaking, a space is simply connected if it has no holes or handles. One way to test if a space is simply connected is to draw a loop starting and ending at the same base point, then check if we can continuously shrink the loop to a single point at the base point. If all such loops can be contracted, the space is simply connected. If the space has holes or handles, we will be able to draw loops that cannot be continuously shrunk to a single point. All spheres with dimension equal to or greater than 2 are simply connected. It should be obvious on the 2 sphere that any loop we draw can be contracted to a point. The same is true for the 3 sphere and all higher dimensional spheres. The exception is the 1 sphere, or circle, which is not simply connected. Since the 3 sphere is simply connected, this means that the space of SU2 matrices, or unit quaternions, is also simply connected. Real projective spaces are not simply connected. For example, the real projective plane, RP2, is a sphere with opposite points made equivalent. If we have a loop like this that we try to contract, if we contract part of the loop, the opposite end of the loop will run away in the opposite direction, because opposite points on the sphere are equivalent. Therefore, loops like this cannot be continuously shrunk to a point. The same is true for real projective space RP3, which is the space of SO3 matrices. So the space of SO3 matrices is not simply connected. The topology of spaces of rotations can be useful to think about. For example, it's common to think of rotations in 3D space as a combination of three rotation angles, one for each axis. These are the so-called Euler angles, with each angle being on a circle from 0 to 360 degrees. However, this system has flaws. In particular, the order of the rotation angles matters. Rotating around X and then Y is not the same thing as rotating around Y and then X. This awkwardness is reflected in the topology of Euler angles. The combination of two rotation angles, or two circles, gives a space that looks like a torus and the combination of three rotation angles, or three circles, gives us a three-dimensional torus, T3. This is not equivalent to the real projective space RP3, or its double cover, S3. Points in RP3 or S3 immediately specify the correct axis and angle we need to do the rotation. Instead of providing three separate rotations and assuming there is a specific order or priority in the angle coordinates. The idea of double covers doesn't just apply to 3D space. We can also apply it to 4D space time. If you watched video 9 in this series, you'll recall that in the four dimensional space time of special relativity, Lorentz transformations are done with SO13 matrices. 
These are matrices that keep the spacetime interval S squared constant and forbid spatial reflections since the determinant is plus one. We can also enforce the orthochronous property, which means there are no time reflections, by forcing the zero zero component of the matrix to be positive. The plus superscript above SO indicates we're including this condition of no time reflections. I'm going to assume this orthochronous condition applies for the rest of this video. We also learned that we could rewrite 4D spacetime vectors as 2x2 two two matrices called vial vectors, and we could Lorentz transform those with double sided transformations involving special linear 2x2 two two complex matrices. SL2C. This means that SL2C is the double cover of SO13. As there are two SL2C matrices for every SO13 matrix that performs the same Lorentz transformation. Again, negative signs will cancel out in double sided transformations. SO11 is the set of Lorentz transformations in one time dimension and one space dimension. This set of transformations gives a hyperbola, which extends infinitely in either direction. Hyperbolas are transformed with hyperbolic rotations, using hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. These are also called Lorentz boosts. This is different than the set of rotations in two spatial dimensions, SO2, which gives a circle, transformed with circular trig functions. Hyperbolas have the topological property of being non-compact, which loosely means that they go on forever. So hyperbolic angles range from negative infinity to positive infinity. This is unlike circles, which are compact and have a finite extent. And so circular angles will loop back on themselves. SO12 is the set of Lorentz transformations in one time dimension and two space dimensions. We now have two spatial dimensions we can boost in, given by two hyperbolas, and we can also rotate around in a circle in the two spatial dimensions. This gives us a hyperboloid sheet. In contrast, SO3 is the group of rotational symmetries of 3D space, which is given by the three possible rotations of the two sphere. SO13 is the set of Lorentz transformations in one time dimension and three spatial dimensions. I can't draw this, but it would be a higher dimensional hyperboloid, with three possible hyperbola boosts and three possible circles to rotate in. In contrast, SO4 is the group of rotation symmetries of 4D space, which is the six possible rotations of the three sphere. SL2C is the double cover of SO13 and is given by a set of six basic 2x2 two two matrices that operate on spinners on the block sphere. Three of these matrices do the basic rotations of the block sphere that we're familiar with. But there are also three boost matrices, which can also transform the block sphere. If we boost in the plus Z direction, then the plus Z and minus Z spinners stay fixed. Circles centered around the Z axis are pushed in the direction of the negative Z spinner as we continue boosting. There is a similar effect for X boosts and Y boosts. As an exercise, you can try coming up with a mathematical argument for why these matrices push circles in one direction on the block sphere. You can look at the limiting behaviors of hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine to help you. Keep in mind overall scaling and phases don't matter for spinners on the block sphere. Recall, two spinners are mathematically orthogonal if they point in opposite directions on the block sphere. This is because opposite directions on the block sphere represent two mutually exclusive measurement states in the stern gerlach experiment. You'll notice that if we have two spinners that are orthogonal, and then we perform a boost operation on the sphere, it is possible that the spinners are no longer orthogonal after the boost. This would seem to violate Born's rule, which says that probabilities in quantum mechanics are directly related to the angle between state vectors. 
If we do a boost, two spinners can be orthogonal in one frame, but be non-orthogonal in another frame. This makes it seem like quantum mechanics is not compatible with Lorentz boosts from special relativity. This is one of the challenges that comes with uniting quantum mechanics with special relativity. This contradiction is solved in quantum field theory, where we treat particles as excitations in fields that extend all throughout space, which include position degrees of freedom as well as rotational degrees of freedom. However, I won't be talking about that in this video. I'll mention one last thing about SL2C, which is how it relates to Mobius transformations. Recall that for spinners that represent quantum states, overall multiplication by a non-zero complex number doesn't change the quantum state, because these overall factors are cancelled out in the normalized Born's rule. Because of this, spinners are completely defined by the ratio of their two components. Let's take a two-component spinner with components psi and transform it by a 2x2 two two matrix to give another two-component spinner with components psi tilde. Since only the ratio of the output components matters, we can write the matrix multiplication as a pair of equations and take their ratio. We can also multiply the numerator and denominator by 1 over psi 2 to give us ratios of the input components. I'm going to write this ratio of input components as z and the ratio of output components as z tilde. This is an alternative way of writing transformations on spinners, and it's called a Mobius transformation, also called a fractional linear transformation. Notice that if we take the matrix coefficients and multiply them by an arbitrary complex number, this will not affect the Mobius transformation, since the factors will cancel out in the fraction formula. This means that any matrices that differ by an overall multiplication of a complex number perform the same transformation. This allows us to scale the matrices by any complex number we like and therefore set the matrix determinant to any number we like. We can choose a scaling number which sets the determinant of the matrix to plus 1. You might think that this gives us the SL2C matrices, but not quite. Since overall scaling doesn't change the transformation, this means that the positive version of a matrix is equivalent to the negative version of that matrix. So this doesn't give us SL2C, but instead its projected version, SO13, which is also sometimes called the projective special linear matrices, PSL2C. So we see that Mobius transformations are equivalent to Lorentz transformations, SO13, on spinners. Now these double covers of the rotation and Lorentz groups actually have special names. They are called spin groups. For example, the double cover of SO3 is called the group spin 3, which also happens to be equivalent to SU2. The double cover of SO13 is called the group spin 13, which also happens to be equivalent to SL2C. We were able to figure out what the spin 3 and spin 13 groups were using intuition and cleverness over the past few videos. Once we found there were ways to represent 3D spatial vectors and 4D spacetime vectors as 2x2 matrices, we ended up figuring out, through a mix of trial and error, that we could rotate the components of these 2x2 matrices using double sided transformations and this gave us the double covers SU2 and SL2C, which are also called spin 3 and spin 13. But there's a more systematic way of building these spin groups. For any dimension n, given the rotation group SON, there's a systematic way of constructing its double cover, spin n. If you think of the unit length quaternions as being the group spin 3, then the group spin n would be the generalization of the quaternions for any arbitrary dimension n. Likewise, for any space time with p time dimensions and q space dimensions, we have the Lorentz group SOPQ. 
there's a systematic way of constructing its double cover spin PQ. The systematic way of constructing these spin groups involves the use of Clifford algebras, also called geometric algebras, which is what we're going to cover in the next few videos in this series. Clifford algebras can be thought of as generalizations of complex numbers, quaternions, and the sigma matrices, as well as the Dirac matrices from the Dirac equation in particle physics. The key idea behind Clifford algebras is having symbols that square to either plus one or minus one that also anti-commute with each other. These simple properties let us do some very impressive things. We normally think of scalars, vectors, spinners, and the rotation operations on these objects as being separate kinds of objects. But in Clifford algebras, all these objects live together side by side. This doesn't give us any new math or physics, but it does let us rewrite certain equations in math and physics in impressively clean ways. For example, it's possible to write the four Maxwell equations of electricity and magnetism as a single equation using Clifford algebras. It's also possible to write the Dirac equation, which models free spin one-half particles in quantum mechanics, using Clifford algebras. We can also systematically build spinners in Clifford algebras as well. So if you want to learn more about Clifford algebras, you can move on to the next video, Spinners for Beginners number 11.